Welcome back to another UFC fight prediction video. In this video, I'll be predicting the prelim fights for UFC Fight Night 176, Woodley versus Burns. So without further ado, let's get to our first fight on the card and our first fight on the prelim. So in our first fight, we have in the featherweight division, Chris Gutierrez versus Vince Morales. So look at this fight right here. You got Vince Morales. He's the slightly longer fighter. I think about like 5'7". Gutierrez is, well, probably like 5'9 versus 5'7". Not the biggest height difference, but I think Morales could definitely make it noticeable out there. But the real factor in this fight for me is not even the height. I just think that um, between the two, Gutierrez has more experience against higher level competition. And he has more experience winning against higher level competition. Vince Morales is one of those fighters that has pretty much all the, like, the tools you will need out there. But the application is not really there because fighting is more than just about, well, at least kind of like, what's it called? Prize fighting is more than just about your skills. Sometimes it's more about finding ability, like that ability to win. Because some fighters don't have the best technique, but they're winners. Some fighters have all the technique in the world, but they always end up on the other side of the six. And sometimes it's not their fault because the judges just suck. But sometimes it's just their lack of output or their lack of doing the right things when need to be done. Like you see a fight, and they're too much on the back foot and they're not really putting enough power on their shots enough that, that will sway the judges. Like, they might be out landing the fighter, but they aren't landing the heavy shots they need to land. And yes, in the last fight, he got robbed. He dropped his opponent in the first round, close second round, and completely outstruck him in the third round. But outside of that fight, and some of these other fights, he's too much on the back foot. He doesn't shoot any shots. He doesn't pressure as much as he needs to out there. Like I said, he doesn't like do takedowns. So a little bit more aggression, a little more oomph on the shots, and a lot of stuff like that. A lot of times we'll get you in these situations where you're losing fights that you probably could have won. You have the skills to win. You have the talent to win, but you're not doing the things that need to be done to win, whereas Chris Gutierrez has. So I think talent-wise, about, they're about the same talent, but matter of fact, Morales probably has more talent in reality. But Chris Gutierrez just has a higher fight IQ, and he has that ability to win, and he'll mix in takedowns. I think he's smarter out there as far as he knows what the judges see. He knows what he needs to be done. Like, he knows what needs to be done to win. That's really what it comes down to. Chris Gutierrez... I see him pressuring this fight, attacking the legs of Morales, mixing up high, low, going for takedowns, and things that will score points, things that will be favored by the judge. Like, if you're pressuring, that's favored. You're going for takedowns, especially if you're scoring takedowns, that's favored. Especially in a fight that it will, could potentially be close, and I see it being one of the close fights. But I see Gutierrez pressure, even though he might not be the one with the higher work rate, he'll be the one pressuring, he'll be the one drawing the heavier strikes, landing the heavier strikes, and he'll be the one doing multiple, presenting multiple threats, not just the striking, but wrestling and striking. So it'll be wrestling, grappling, and striking. He'll try to take the fight to the ground, put um, Morales against the cage, take him down, like cage control, takedown attempts, whether he's getting them or not, I think he'll at least get one or two takedowns in this fight. Reason Morales has pretty good takedown defense, but so I see getting one or two takedowns and probably at one point having good control. I see this fight going to a decision, but like I said, the factors of Gutierrez pressuring, pressuring, landing the heavier shots, and whether he gets taken out or not, the fact that he's going for them and pressuring and attempting these shots and getting that cage control will fa will factor in his favor. So in this fight, I got Chris Gutierrez via decision. Now on to our next fight, we have in the bantamweight division, Louis Smoker versus Casey Kenny. So this is a pretty straightforward one right here. Um, Louis Smoker is a talented fighter. He's a great. Well, let me not say great. He's a good fighter. He's a solid fighter. Great. It's no insult to him that he's not great, but greatness is a certainly on a different tier than what he is. Like greatness is like the top of the top, or at least seeing the top and being competitive with the top. But yeah, solid fighter, good striking, good jujitsu, good world rounder fighter. He's a solid. He's a solid fighter. Going against Case Kenny, and all that's been said about Louis Smoker, but I don't think he does the well that well with fighters that can really take it to him, whether it be on the feet in the striking. Are fighters that can really press them with, with their grappling and their wrestling. Like Casey Kenny is a solid wrestling. We seen him with um, I forget his name right now. Ray Borg. Ray Borg was able to take him down and just dominate him on the ground. And their their fight, like take him down at will, control him at will on the ground. And I think Casey Kenny lost to Ray Borg as well, but they gave the decision to Casey Kenny. But either way, I see Casey. What I'm saying is, I see that Casey. I see that Casey Kenny on the feet. He could definitely strike with Smoker. I would give the striking advantage to Smoker, not significantly, but definitely a clear. A, Semi clear striking advantage for Louis Smoker. Size advantage, Casey Kenny. Pace wise, Casey Kenny. Offensive grappling, who can dictate where the fight going as far as grappling, Casey Kenny. Like Smoker, it maybe in a jiu-jitsu match, he might beat Kenny. Matter of fact, even in a jiu-jitsu match, he might lose Kenny just off Kenny's top control. So, but really, what I see this fight is that Casey Kenny will be able to really take, like, dictate where this fight is going at all times. On the feet, will be competitive. But on the ground, Casey Kenny getting these takedowns and control and really just stalling out Smoker the whole time on the ground. 
Will he be out there just dominating, um, smoking, just passing his guard, mounting him and grounding pound him and taking his back and submitting him? I don't see that, but I see him taking him down, maybe passing to like a half guard, landing some ground and pound on him, and really not allowing Smoker to ever get the space he needs or get the, the position he needs to really be effective on his back and just really shutting him down and beat him to probably a lackluster decision, but a clear-cut decision. So in this fight, I got Casey Kenny via decision. Now on to our next fight we have in the flyweight division, Tim Elliott versus Brandon Royval. So both guys are 5'7", age not no big factor. Experience is definitely a big factor. Is um, Tim Elliott has fought a lot of the best fighters in this weight class and in other weight classes as well, especially the um, flyweight GOAT in um, Mighty Mouse. So he's been around. Brandon Royval for some decent competition here. I think the best person he fought is Casey Kenny. But outside that, how I see this fight really playing down is both Five seven, so no real big, no height difference for. I mean, no height advantage for either fighter. What I see with Roy Val is he has great output. He'll throw a lot of shots out there with decent technique, but the way he strikes is like he only trains by hitting a heavy bag or something, or hitting a punching bag. Because there is no striking defense at all from like he just throws his chin up and like you know when somebody trying to just train their cardio and just punching the bag and they're not worried about defense, they're not moving their head or nothing, or they're not really bringing their hands back to their chin and they're keeping their chin up. They just you know, just firing as much shots as they can at a punch back because nothing's coming back. That's how he fights. A lot of shots, chin up, throwing shots, hands not coming back to his chin, not moving, not adjusting his feet, just firing. Like, in MMA, he could get away with that a lot because a lot of people don't really have, not going to let you get away with that because they're not going to counter that. They're going to be so worried about getting punched that they're going to move away or just back up and allow you to keep being sloppy like that. But yeah, either way, sloppy, and he still get caught in MMA either way with the sloppy stuff he does. Like, he just... Be doing kicks, no setup, doing punches, no setup, doing punches, chin flying up. When, like, those shots, he just stays in the same place. So, really, if you just evade or step off, he's right to be hit. Or you just step back and counter. Like, I'm not even going to get into the whole what he's open for. But he's open for everything. It's not even what he is open for. He's open for the kitchen sink. But he's doing a bunch of volume out there. He doesn't have the most power to be doing that eye. Like, for a guy that's so confident just to be doing shots out there and with his chin up, he doesn't have the most power. Like, He's not really, the risk versus reward of being that sloppy is not there. Like, he get away from it, with it, like I said, because people, people, people like him get away with that stuff. But it's really just volume, not the most damage behind him. He has some pretty good jiu-jitsu. So, really, in the fight, Tim Elliott actually having more power than Roy Val. And he can keep up with him pace-wise. He definitely doesn't throw as much volume as Roy Val, because Roy Val throws a whole rack of volume, but sloppy. Because Elliott, even though he'd be sloppy at times, he at least you can see that he has some good fundamentals, good technique. He just chooses to be sloppy. Like, Roy Val just doesn't have no choice. He just is sloppy. Takedown defense is pretty poor. So I feel like Tim Elliott, I mean, Tim Elliott can definitely count him on the feet and drop him and then probably submit him or finish him. But I really see um, Tim Elliott just taking advantage of his sloppiness, maybe tagging him up a little bit when he's swinging these sloppy shots. And Elliott is the faster fighter. And I definitely see him when Roy Val is doing these shots, no setup, like whether they be kicks or punches. Like I would have seen him catching the kicks and going for takedowns or ducking under and getting the takedowns. I can see Tim Elliott just dominating this fight on the ground. That's really why I see this fight going. It's, Yes, Roy Val has some decent submission, decent grappling, but Tim Elliott is an experienced, fight, experienced fighter. I don't think Roy Val presents any areas where um, Tim Elliott has been beaten. Like, you know, certain abilities or attributes or skill set that has shown to beat Tim Elliott. He doesn't have the power. He's not that technically sound. So, really, I see Tim Elliott is really just being a veteran in this fight, taking advantage of his mistakes on the feet, taking him on, down on the ground, and just really just roughing him up for three rounds to a decision. So, in this fight, I got Tim Elliott via decision. Now on to our next fight we have in the light heavyweight division, Jamal Hill versus Clitson Abreu. So looking at this fight right here, you got, um, I'm going to be cut and dry with this one right here. Jamal Hill, solid fighter. I definitely underrated him in a, in a previous prediction, but a solid fighter, good length, only like 6'2", 6'3", big, good power kicks, heavy-handed punches, creative out there, but still, back straight up, hands be low a lot, chin be up. So, Anybody that should really have any decent striking should be able to definitely make him pay for that, but nobody's really been making him pay for that. I don't think Clinton Abreu would do it either. And nothing about Jamal Hill. Takedown defense actually isn't the best. Grappling definitely isn't the best. He should definitely work on those things. I think he probably will or should have already done it. But I'm expecting him to at least be a little bit better than he was in his last fight with that. And his last opponent didn't really pressure him with that as much or really attempted many takedowns as he should have or really implemented grappling as much as he should have. But either way, I think Jamal Hill should probably have worked on those areas a little bit more. I still see him leaving his chin up. I still see him drop his hands a lot. But I don't see Abreu as the highest level striker. He has some 
He could put out some good output there, has some decent technique behind the strikes, has some good high, a good high kick, good volume. But his setups to takedowns aren't the best. Like he kind of just falls in on these takedowns, which I think Jamal Hill will be able to stuff easily. Coming straight in, I think he's not the fastest fight either. So I think Jamal Hill, you know, his striking has flaws defensively. I think he'll be able to tag Abreu, the slower fighter, coming straight on a straight line, be able to tag him up, step off the side, kind of chew him up a little bit. And really, I don't see Abreu having most success with getting the fight to the ground. And this fight has been a striker ma- striking matchup and Jamal Hill being a better striker. That's the cut and dry how I see this fight going. And I think Jamal Hill just picks him apart on the feet for most of this fight. I think Abreu might get a desperation takedown at one point in this fight, but it's probably too late. Or it's going to be by the point where he's already taking so much damage that Jamal Hill, even though he gets taken down, will be able to spring back up. And I really just see him dicing um, Abreu up on the feet and then put him away in the late stages of that second round. So in this fight, I got Jamal Hill via second round TKO. Now to our cold prelim headliner we have in the ca- in the catchweight bout, Billy Quarantillo versus Spike Carlisle. So look at this fight right here. Billy Quarantillo is 31. Spike Carlisle is thinking about 27, something like that, 26. Younger than he looks. He looks like a middle-aged um, leprechaun, but that's besides the point. What I see right here, I see Billy Quarantillo, probably the cleaner striker, probably um, the cleaner put-together mixed martial artist overall. But Carlisle has the power. And he's the be- far better grappler. So, like, Quarantillo, like, he might have to be the guy that's more solid as far as technique-wise and chaining it all together. But Carlisle is stronger. He hits harder. And, that's, and he has the better grappling. Like, Carantillo could put it all together. But I think it's more so with his, for him to win, it's going to have to be making, limiting his mistakes and really trying to address the threats that Carlisle's presenting. Whereas Carlisle just got to be himself out there. And I don't think Quarantillo's going to be able to have such a clean performance. I don't think he has any real super outstanding talents or techniques or skill set. Like, he wants to fight that's solid in every area and pretty, like, like he's a, re- a good talent. But I only see you know, him having no real edge in Carlisle outside, like I said, oh, the overall package. If he really put it all together and just limited his mistakes and really was able to address what Carlisle was presenting, he could have won. But it's really, when you when your whole game plan is just to try to limit what someone else is doing, it's hard for you to win out there. So what I really see is Carlisle pressuring. I see Carlisle landing the big shots. And Quarantillo trying to address that, but it's really going to be this the uh, once like really this the uh, Carla like been a bull like he is out there. He goes out there, swings these big shots. Sometimes the technique isn't the best, but he's been very successful with his technique, even though it isn't the cleanest. He hits hard. He's aggressive, and he's a guy that's going to definitely be that bull out there. He's going to be pr- like that forward pressure, nonstop heavy shots. Uh, r- real aggressive with his takedowns. Real aggressive with his grappling. And Quarantillo, I don't think is like I said, he doesn't have the most power. He's not the better grappler. And it's not like his technique is so much cleaner than Carlos. Just all together, he's just cleaner. He's the guy that's, I don't know, kind of fights more to text. Like I said, he's the more text. That's what I would say. He's more textbook. And being more textbook, only the only time being more textbook works better is on a test. And this is not a test. This is a fight. So really, I was like, to see Carlisle being a Carlisle, being out there, being aggressive. Quarantillo trying to deal with that, but not really having an answer for it for the aggression and the pace and the pressure of Carlisle to see Carlisle just dominating this fight, throwing him around, pressuring him, landing big shots, taking him down, and then we- weathering on him. And I see him submitting him late in the third round. So in this fight, I got Spark- Car- Spike Carlisle via third round submission. Now to our prelim headliner we have in the w- women's flyweight division, Caitlin Chukagian versus Antoni- Antonina Shevchenko. So this fight is really, really like cut and dry. Kaylin Chukagian is a good fighter. She's a solid fighter. She's certainly earned her title shot in a division that really doesn't have much to earn or really you don't need much to earn a title shot. She earned a title shot in that division. Yeah, she's most certainly earned her title shot in this division because it doesn't, like, like I said, you don't need much to earn a title shot. But in this fight right here, Kaylin Chukagian, she's pretty much a striker. That's what she is. Like, she has some decent, okay grappling, but she's not the guy, not the, I mean, I said guy, not the woman or the fighter that's really going to pressure with her grappling. And we already seen just in from one loss in grappling, that are due to grappling that in her next fight, Shevchenko submitted her next opponent. Like Shevchenko, just like her sister, they're, perf- or at least try to be perfectionists. Like they're try to be solid in every area. They try to fix up their holes. When they have a mistake, they make big leaps and bounds to, you know, they do what they need to do to fix those holes. So I'm mixing it in, in it is about the grappling, but really what I'm saying, seeing in this fight is this is going to be a striking matchup. And Shukagian is a solid striker and all, but Shevchenko and the Shevchenko sisters, they're just on a whole different tier of striking. And also in this fight, Chukagian won't have as much height as she had over her sister because 
Antonina is actually taller than Valentina. I think she's about like three or four inches. Well, obviously about three inches. So Shukagan only have a one inch height advantage over Shevchenko. So really her best advantages aren't really even there. She's not tall, is, doesn't have as much of a height advantage as she, she usually has over her, her opponents. She's going against a better striker. Her She's going against a fighter that can put as much output as her. So usually her opponents don't have as high of an output rate as Chukagian. And now she's going against a fighter with similar height, similar output, and far more more credential in the striking. I really think Shevchenko could beat her in all areas, just like her sister beat her in all areas. But I'm saying she's going to put on as good of a performance, like as good on, I'm, I'm stuttering, as good of a performance as her sister. I'm not saying that, but I can see her out striking her. I can see her mixing and grappling and dominating and grappling aspects as well. And I was really just thinking every area of this fight, Shevchenko can beat her. Volume, pace, technique, easily grappling. And just doing the right things you need to do out there to secure a victory. So how I see this fight going, I see a fill-out process early. But I think once they start to get in the groove, I think Shevchenko's more her credentials really start to show. And she starts to chew up Shukagin on the feet. Definitely starts to take note of or use notes from what her sister did to her. And start to pick her apart there. And then she starts to mix in the grappling. Starts to dominate on the ground. She demoralizes her on her feet. The first round, like I said, the first part going to probably be a little bit of mixing. But probably by the two-minute mark, she's not going to have her filled, figured out find her range, start to pick her apart. Probably towards the end of that round, like the fourth round, four, like the minute four, she's going to take her down or at least attempt it. Just present it. Second round, continue more with the striking. Mid portion, probably that's the two minute, take her down, dominate on the ground to, for that two minute mark. And I think third round, she really starts to put it on her in the feet. And then I think she stops her within three minutes of that third round via TKO. So in this fight, I have Antonina Shevchenko via third round TKO. And that so that concludes my fight predictions for the prelims of UFC Fight Night 176, Woodley versus Burns. And as always, thanks for watching.